I would take okay. the time. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Actually, I'm presenting on behalf of Markus Achtenmeyer, who's sorry that he cannot be here. He's very tied up with other tasks at home, so he asked me to come here and present <coughs> and present our um, results or, well, um, um, progress on um, one particular experiment or type of experiments at the University of Vienna. And we are trying to measure the gravitational interaction of very small masses. Um, so all this is based on a PhD um, thesis that uh, came out last year, um, where um, Jonas actually designed this whole experiment. And hopefully it will also become obvious why we are somehow in a superposition between a big G and a midi G experiment and what this means. So I'd like to start with a quote that actually came up very often in my former institute. I worked at the AI Hanover, so on gravitational waves before, and people often cited John Wheeler who said that space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. The first part of this is rather obvious and by now, when we're dealing with quantum system, we see quantum effects created by gravity. So in the famous cow experiment, um, neutrons in a neutron interferometer, they um, gather some phase dependent on the depth of the gravitational potential they travel through, and you can see the interference pattern from this. We learned from Marcus Arendt that in his experiments in um, matter wave interferometry, the gravity also plays an important role. However, he also stated that uh, their gravity is just a parameter, and it's also just the gravity caused by the gravitational potential of the Earth, so a rather big mass, rather far from being a quantum thing. And recently, atom, uh, atom fountains got to a sensitivity where the phase, the phase uh, of the particles or clouds of atoms um, sensed in these interferometers are sensitive to the distribution of mass around this atom fountain. Um, so here you see some source masses, and then when you redistribute them, you'll gather some more or less phase. Um, however, these masses are still on the order of hundreds of kilograms up to tons, so still quite big. So. Let's have a look at this chart. Um, how far are we actually from quantum source masses? On the left side, there are quantum systems. Um, they are typically very, very light. On the right side, we see gravitationally interacting uh, masses, so source masses. They are still, it might surprise you, on the order of kilograms or 100 grams. So the smallest experiment so far um, using a source, or the smallest source mass used so far is actually about 100 grams. So while the experiments here on the left, the quantum experiments, are pushing towards higher and higher masses, um, potentially serving as source masses for gravity in the future, our goal is, or uh, actually, yeah, all these, um, these experiments I mentioned before, and while they are pushing towards higher masses, trying to use, for example, bigger molecules in atom wave interferometry, our goal is to reduce the mass that can actually be sensed. So this is a quite technical question, actually. Um, how well can we isolate our measurement system from environmental noise, from all sorts of disturbances, so that we still can sense gravity of very small masses, so very small gravity? In the past, this was usually done um, so gravity is very, very weak, and uh, therefore this was usually done by some sort of torsional balances. Torsional balances provide very, very soft potential, so you get some huge amplification factor in terms of displacement of some mass or some sensor um, per exerted force. However, the progress in um, micromechanical experiments in the past and the experience in our group that actually led to the idea, why not use such a micromechanical system as a sensor? So here we see a test mass that is held by some support that just prevents it from falling down. And our experiments 
now is aiming for an improvement of a factor of 1,000 in the source mass. Um, so we are dealing or talking about um, 100 milligram masses. When you want to send some, some gravity, of course, you have to exert gravity. So there must be a source mass, uh, which is shown here. However, measurements at DC, so at low frequencies, are very, very noisy. Uh, so the idea is to somehow modulate gravity, bring it up to higher Fourier frequencies, where you can um, better isolate your system from environmental noise. How can that be done? Well, modulate the position of your source mass, um, and then this modulates the gravitational field at the test mass. Um, for the readout of the, uh, readout of the test mass, we can use or we plan to use the, the best we can think of, which is just optical interferometry. That is the, as we saw from the recent results from, um, for example, gravitational wave um, detection, is a very powerful tool to um, measure the position of a device. Um, and we might have to isolate these masses from each other by some optional shielding membrane. Um, why is that? Well, there is, of course, some sort of direct coupling. When you want to amplify the gravitational interaction, you have to bring your masses very close together. And then there are a lot of direct couplings, like, for example, the recoil. Well, that doesn't depend on the, on the uh, proximity, but the recoil via your system can propagate to, into your um, test mass. Of course, the residual gas molecules in your vacuum chamber, they can transfer momentum from mass, one mass to the other. There might be electrostatic um, interaction, so you might need some uh, electrically conducting surface in between. However, there are other, other noise terms. Inevitably, because you have to hold this, this test mass in place and preventing it from falling down to the ground, there will be environmental disturbances coupling in. This might be seismic motion, so motion of the ground that is always there, um, although you can't feel it. That might be acoustics in the lab environment or just thermal drift. So um, our, temp our labs are never super stable. Um, of course, the readout will also be some, somehow noisy. So there is, if you do optical interferometry, there will always be the shot noise as the ultimate limit. But also the interferometer might couple in some noise or the detector. And most important for us, because that's our ultimate limit, is the thermal bath. The thermal bath couples in via the support structure, so via our micromechanical oscillator, into this position of this mass. Um, this is some sort of um, uh, sensitivity curve if you're used to dealing with frequency dependent effects. However, this is a um, uh, mass size, so to say, um, um, sensitivity. And you see about at one millimeter um, source mass diameter, the gravitational um, signal will surpass the th um, thermal noise if we assume a test mass um, resonance frequency and oscillator um, frequency of about 50 hertz and a quite reasonable Q, realistic Q of 20,000. However, look at this. These are relatively small masses. Even if we use gold to, um, to gather as much, to concentrate as much mass into as small um, sphere as possible to get the center of masses close together, um, we need an integration time of about 60 minutes or so one hour um, to get a sensible signal out of this experiment. About the readout of the, of the oscillator, um, I said optical interferometry is a very powerful tool. In particular, we are considering polarization-based Mazinda interferometer. Um, the signal, the phase signal connected in one arm with respect to the other is then sends in a balanced homodyne detector. Um, this, is, this is very nice because you can cancel the noise that occurs on the two photodiodes um, in the same mode and subtract this. Um, 
But the nicest thing is that you can realize this interferometer as a common path interferometer. So all the light, um, the, the two light beams here shown in red and blue, they co-propagate through, the, through all the optics um, commonly. So they collect the same, for example, thermal drifts of the phase um, inside these um, materials. And this results in a super stable signal. Even if we set up just a tabletop experiment like this one here with standard components on air, um, I should say we can, we can tune, for example, the, the, the phase that is um, quite delicate in such common path interferometers. You need some actuator that actuates differently, in this case, on the different polarization modes. So this um, uh, device does it. If you do so, then you can obtain an interference pattern. Um, and if you set up the interferometer with standard components like this in a, state, in a normal environment, the um, drifts are already astonishingly small. So we obtain a few, few nanometers over the course of minutes. If you transform this into spectra, um, cause we don't decide on a certain frequency where we want to sense, um, this looks like this, so in red shown our interferometer noise and in blue the ultimate limit of our detector, which will become important in a second because, well, in addition to the thermal noise, so we have thermal noise on the resonance of our um, oscillator, um, but it would be a lot nicer to measure also the off-resonant thermal noise because then you don't suffer from ring-ins, for example, ring-ins, of this uh, high Q oscillator and ring down, so you just measure um, at a different frequency at the part than the particular um, oscillation frequency. Um, if you want to do so, you have to push down your sensing noise quite a lot, so you have to use milliwatts of power, which is quite much for such a small oscillator. However, um, we showed that with a slightly more um, uh, well, with an interferometer that was um, particular made for this um, um, experiment um, in a thermal housing, uh, we showed that we can get noise a lot down compared to what we saw before. So here you see drifts of only a few nanometers over the course of a weekend. So this is from Friday to Monday when people came back and heated the lab up again. And when we look at this in terms of frequency, um, you see we bring down the curve from red, the sensitivity curve from red to green. So we are at the moment limited by our detector. However, we also have a student working on that, improving the um, detector. So we are almost at the dark noise of the detector. Talking about the detector, well, uh, there's a student who, who tries one electronics and then some other electronics and other electronics. And up to now, we were using this com commercial um, detector, which brings us down to 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 40 meter per square hertz sensitivity, uh, which is about one order of magnitude above uh, what we actually need. So there are some latest sensitivities or, or uh, latest um, designs shown here. However, um, here you see um, the commercial detector I showed before, which suffers a lot from, for example, electronic incoupling, especially at low frequencies where the curve goes up. By now, we can construct a lot better detectors. So here you see the sensitivity curve of our uh, of the detector I showed you um, before that the student constructed, which is super flat. This is now limited by the ADC noise, so we need to use a better ADC, and he'll provide an onboard 24-bit super state-of-the-art ADC with even less noise. Um, and he already showed that this can bring us down to about the 10 to the minus 50 meter per square hertz region where we actually can sense the off-resonant thermal noise or then gravitational signals surpassing this. Um,
I briefly mentioned this before. Um, the um, readout is a balanced homodyne scheme. So we compare the photo current of one photo diet with the photo current of another photo diet, subtracting this, uh, these, and this provides us a lot better um, or a, a, a huge increase in common mode rejection. However, we might not always be on our operation point, which is simply because our oscillator will move even on the order of nanometers, as you saw before. It still creates um, huge signals for the electronics, so you might need some sort of um, some sort of feedback. There is one technique that is not very well known, and therefore I would like to mention it. That is, you can um, convert the readout of your photo diet into a photo current, and then add it to the photo currents you created in this balanced homodyne detector. So you're subtracting um, in the domain of photo currents. With this, you can improve your detector a lot. However, it is difficult to measure in such a feedback system uh, or, or to calibrate such a feedback system. And because of that, uh, we are actually opting for another version where you optically feedback um, to the position of the, of the test mass. Or in our case, we don't want to touch the test mass. That's our holy grail, not move it. So we feedback to the phase, which can be done for example, by an electro-optic modulator, which is a nice, th nice thing to mention, because an electro-optic modulator can modulate differential, differentially the phase of horizontal and vertical, because the electro-optic effect is polarization dependent. I'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about the actual test mass oscillator. So the first FEM simulation showed that, uh, as I uh, showed you before, um, that with two millimeter diameter and 50 hertz, uh, we should be able to measure the gravitational signal. And this was still based on some um, former experience with ALGAS design, so alumin aluminum gallium arsenide designs. However, this, um, this knowledge somehow evaded our group, um, and now we are more on the track of other materials, which I will mention in a second. Um, so how do you construct such an oscillator? Well, the brute force method is use a membrane. Everybody uses, for example, silicon nitride membranes, but we need to increase the mass, so load it with the mass. This gives reasonably high Q, so less than a factor of 10 um, below what we actually want to achieve. Um, however, the, the frequencies are super, super high because there's all this restoring force of this huge area of the membrane. So cut things out like here. That was actually our next try. However, didn't really work. And then we looked into other sorts of oscillators and found these gravitational wave uh, detector pendulums, talked a bit about it, and said, why don't we shrink such a huge 40 kilogram pendulum down to 100 milligrams? OK. Well, uh, this is some sort of design. Um, and we actually managed to produce such a small pendulum. Um, so the way how you make such a thing is, especially the low frequency um, is, is quite critical in these uh, micromechanical oscillators to achieve that. Because in the past, people were pushing towards higher and higher and higher frequencies to escape all this low frequency noise. However, at high frequencies, our signal goes smaller and smaller due to the inertia of our test mass. And we need to push back to lower frequencies again. So the way you do, uh, you, you create such oscillators is you use some sort of wafer material. This is coated on the surface. Then you, whoops, sorry. Um, then you write your structure into this, um, into a mask, <coughs> excuse me, um, on the surface of um, this, this wafer. And then you perform some 1D etching into the surface of this chip. Um, don't worry about the edges. That's just technical problems. But here you see three rows of oscillators, um, and we're sweeping a lot of parameters. Why do we do so? Well, in the next step, um, you might do some mass loading, which was not done so far, so that is grayed out. 
But the next step then is some sort of 3D um, etching, which is selective only for the wafer material. So you grab behind these thin structures and the coating, the silicon nitride in our case, on the surface, um, and you dig behind, and with this you actually release these oscillators. So there you see there are these tethers still are, are dark lines um, because there's still silicon behind. In this next etching step, you dig the silicon out and then everything is hanging. From then on, these things are super, super sensitive. Super sensitive, especially to accelerations. Just for size comparison, again, our one cent coin. We had some trouble of, um, of actually performing the step, so there were a lot of sheds, and we were producing lots and lots and lots of oscillators. Um, and yes, um, here is a test structure in the very bottom of this, um, um, of this chip showing there are some weird additional materials. So we were never able uh, to go beyond about uh, 1,000 in our queue. And just to remember you, we actually have to get to 20,000-ish. Um, the reason for this is, are these, these structures behind the tethers where due to um, the manufacturing process, there was some trash, some waste behind. Um, however, very recently, uh, we managed to get to break the uh, Q1000 barrier, and we are quite confident um, how to avoid this probably silicon dioxide trash, which creates friction inside the oscillator, therefore dissipation. And in our experiment, this harms because dissipation always means it also drives the position of the oscillator. To show you how super, super sensitive these things are, um, this is a chip, and in there, this tiny black dot, that's an oscillator. And here my colleague just tips with a tweezer. It starts to oscillate like hell, and then actually he tries to lift it up. And just from the shaking of the hand, it goes crazy. So you can't really handle them anymore. Um, so th that is a big challenge remaining, how to finally get them, these devices, from the release process into our actual measurement chamber. One more thing I would like to mention is actually the source mass. I said we have to drive the source mass somehow, and it turns out that when you drive it um, sinusoidally, there is some maximum um, of the signal to noise ratio of the gravity per thermal noise, which is slightly more than uh, one millimeter of amplitude at 50 hertz if we do so, or Marcus actually aims for 100 hertz, which is even more difficult, because even at 50 hertz, this means accelerations of 25 Gs. So our approach is use some sort of linkage system and then some um, long-range piezo so the actuation of a long-range piezo, which is usually on the order of 100 micrometers or so, is amplified by this linkage system, and you get out about one millimeter of um, position modulation. So here is a small video showing you how this actually works. Here are the long-range piezos, and here uh, will be our test mass, uh, our source mass attached with a pr plunger to get this, separate this spatially from, um, from our setup. Um, I'll run the video, start at low frequencies, then we are cranking up the frequency, and at some point you'll just see aliasing from the limited uh, refreshing rate of the camera. This thing pa test, um, passed almost all the tests. Um, now the next generation is being um, being tried out in ultra high vacuum environment. Um, and this is a really cool thing, because this is basically an arbitrary waveform generator for mechanics. You can apply whatever waveform you want up to 
100 or 200 hertz. So we can not only sinusoidally modulate our position, but we can also involve higher harmonics and with that create a harmonic gravitational signal, which would not be the case if we p modulate the position harmonically because of um, um, the one over R depends of the gravitational potential. I mentioned earlier that uh, we also need some isolation from I environment, and this is actually probably the reason why Marcus um, got me from my former job where I was suspending mirrors for gravitational wave detectors, and he asked me, can't we just suspend um, like these mirrors with the techniques you know, can't we suspend the whole sensor stage? Well, yeah, we can suspend 40 kilogram masses, so why not suspend a whole um, um, experimental platform? Um, so with a sort of triple suspension in two vertical stages, we can easily fulfill the requirement uh, of 10 to the minus 7 environmental reduction. Um, the slightly more challenging, challenging problem is that you need 13 orders of magnitude of isolation from the moving source mass. Remember, it's moving by about a millimeter with respect to your hopefully not so much moving test mass, which is moving on the order of 10 to the minus 14 meters per squared hertz. So just build another suspension, design it in a way that they both fit into each other, and then you here you have some exper experimental area where you can have source and test mass separated only by about half a millimeter, yet being isolated by 13 orders of magnitude in displacement. That's super astonishing. So with these ingredients, right now we're setting up a new lab, and it's still empty. Why is it so? Well, the vacuum system that is still being tested at the manufacturer, it's not so easy, it turns out. We are aiming to for 10 to the minus 8 millibar. However, many people say, well, just, just heat your system and you'll get rid of all the water. We don't really want to heat the system. There are delicate suspensions inside. There is a delicate micromechanical oscillator inside. There are sensitive piezos inside. Um, so our idea is we try some new technique, relatively new technique, um, which is UV desorption. So you shine UV light into your chamber and with that separate the, all the water molecules from the walls and just pump them, pump them off. And we need to open the system um, many, many, many times because well, there's a rather complicated device inside. And because of that, we are using some um, differential pumping system and vitamin gaskets. Not to spend, I don't know, five gaskets a day or so. So that is how it currently looks like. Uh, we have a suspended breadboard, but not inside vacuum yet. Um, and with this, I would like to come to my summary. Um, I hope I could convince you that uh, with current technology, we are able or soon will be able to de detect the gravitational interaction of two millimeter gold spheres. Most importantly, at room temperature. This gives us some room for improvement later on, reduce the temperature, reduce thermal noise by this, and potentially use smaller masses. And nevertheless, beating the current record in source mass um, by three orders of magnitude. For the future, there are two paths we could um, choose. One is we could increase the mass again. Why would we do that? Well, even um, for bigger masses, it's important, it's interesting because um, the Newton's constant is the least known constant, fundamental constant we have, which is only nailed down by um, to about the fourth digit. And there are experiments um, um, performed at very, very different masses, and they hint that there is something, something underlying we haven't understood, because the 
the spread of all the different measurements is a lot bigger than their, um, than their single um, uncertainties. So they don't agree within their uncertainties. Um, we could potentially also opt for detecting non-Newtonian forces, but I, to my opinion, there are better systems to do that. Um, and the second path would be to decrease the maths further and go towards quantum gravity, approach this gap from the other side and bring up, uh, together quantum systems and gravitationally interacting systems. One potential um, method would be levitated nanospheres or in general levitated um, systems. Maybe you have heard about the Aspen Meyer Labs um, because of levitating stuff. Um, so there are two options. You could levitate, oh, I should actually, this is a video. So here you will see a uh, superconducting particle that is held inside an anti Helmholtz coil um, array. Um, and because it repels the magnetic field, it actually always goes to the very center. And here you see a ring down, so the Q values are not very high yet. However, they can provide very high densities. They can provide high masses, because you can, for example, um, levitate lead. The problem there is, of course, you have very strong fields to levitate this particle. And strong fields meet, mean also strong interaction between the induced field inside your levitated particle and the test mass. The other option would be optically levitated particles. So what we routinely do is we capture particles inside an optical tweezer, inside a waste of a Gaussian beam. And the problem here is that these particles are typically um, not so dense and also a lot lighter. So we cannot really benefit from the super high cues that we can achieve. Yes, and with that, um, last summary, that's, that's our team. Um, and Jonas, uh, who I mentioned earlier, because he initially designed the whole experiment, just dropped out and now was persuaded by um, Bitcoin. So he wants to make money. <laughs> Questions? Uh, <laughs> Sorry? Just, just one moment, tell him. <laughs> no, no, no. Please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, one of the plenary speakers earlier, uh, Ernst Rasel, gave an interesting talk about similar experiments in free fall. So if I were to contemplate pursuing your measurement technique in free fall, then of course a question arises, what is the response time? How fast can your equipment uh, perform a measurement? Uh, would it be suitable for free fall experiments? Well, the uh, response time is relatively fast, so all the measurement equipment uh, is capable of measuring at tens of kilohertz, if not hundreds of kilohertz. Um, I think the big problem is that um, you cannot achieve long free fall times unless you really go to space, which means you have consecutive experiments. And then you need to achieve coherence between all these experiments um, to, in the end, get something like an hour interaction time or so. And I think this is the major problem when doing free fall experiments that only la well, that happen on Earth and only last until the particle clashes into ground again. Well, uh, um, it looks like uh, a, an improvement could be obtained looking at uh, um, superconductor like the Stanford did for the um, uh, to have sphere floating and uh, even uh, superconductor. Are you planning anything in this direction? And first question. Second question, you have any evidence for departure from Newtonian behavior 
at, uh, on these small masses. So, sorry, what was the second question? If you have any evidence for non-Newtonian uh, contribution okay. of gravity in these small uh, masses. Yes, uh, for, the, for the first question, well, we are already performing experiments with levitated superconductors. The problem is it levitates because you create a field that opposes the levitation field, which means your particle actually has a field, so it couples to the environment via its, via its field, and then it's difficult to obtain this 13 orders of magnitude of um, attenuation of the position um, change, um, so the isolation becomes a problem. To your second question, um, we don't have an estimation of um, the amount of non-Newtonian interaction. However, it's probably small, because it will be small compared to the Newtonian interaction. We are already struggling to obtain Newtonian interaction. All the experiments aiming for non-Newtonian interaction, they actually try to cancel, well, successfully cancel this Newtonian interaction and just measure the, the higher orders. And uh, therefore, I'm super convinced that we are not even close to this, um, close to sensitivity to such dedicated experiments. Our goal is really the Newtonian part. Maybe. Um, I have a question about the, the sort of fundamental significance of this. Um, in, in physics, we're used to uh, using, I guess, it's time reversal invariance to, uh, uh, to um, consider many systems. For example, a gravitational wave detector is also a gravitational wave transmitter, maybe not effective, but, but we assume a symmetry. And, um, and if you, uh, um, and then if you consider gravitational experiments, um, we have a, uh, you know, we've seen gravitational experiments done from, you know, from neutron stars coalescing to um, atom, um, uh, atomic fountain experiments that have been that measure gravity acting on individual atoms. Uh, there again, there is we are using as the sort of principle of, of symmetry. So um, what, uh, yeah, in, uh, in the motivation for this, there must be, uh, the motivation must actually be that you're expecting that a source of gravity is not the same as a receiver of gravity, yeah. a breaking of that symmetry. Is that, is that actually what you're trying to test? Well, I, I don't know if there is an actual difference. Um, I'm quite convinced that we have not found a theory describing both at the same time. So we can describe the behavior of quantum system in curved space-time quite well. We cannot um, understand yet how a superposition, for example, a spatial superposition would um, emit gravity. Um, so I, I should have said this probably, that Marcus is of the opinion um, that a spatial position creates a metric superposition. Um, but that's very different from the interaction at the receiver then. So there must be some more general theory that maybe describes this as back and forth um, reversible. Please. Please, it's not connected directly to your experiment, but it was connected to what was Remo asking. Uh, how? Uh, on which scale? I mean, what is the um, scale we uh, we have tested that the gravity will go like one to the r to the power of two? I mean, it's millimeter or uh, like like the Newtonian I mean, one over or r to the power of two or two plus d or it's on millimeter millimeter scales or? Uh... I think I did not understand the question. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, uh, there there is, there is there is a possibility because of uh, uh, because of I mean, uh, some people are asking the string theory about uh, extra dimensions that it, that it will not go like r to the power 
R to 2, but 2 plus D, so on mm -hmm. very small scale. So, I mean, the question is not to do your experiment, but I mean, do you know, I mean, it's on, uh, tested on millimeters, millimeter, or how, how well do we know, we know that uh, on the small scales? I mean. Well, uh, in this case, this experiment would test it on the order of millimeters, because the, um, if, if the source mass size is two millimeters, one millimeter radius, plus a gap of at least half a millimeter, say, to fit a membrane in between, that would be tested on the order of millimeters, two and a half millimeters. However, again, I have to state that probably we'll, we will not be sensitive to such higher order interactions, simply because we suffer or we benefit in the same uh, time from the Newtonian interaction, which other experiments can cancel out. Because of that, they can be much more sensitive at the same separation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just my curiosity, then we stop because uh, we have to go. Yeah. Um, I have seen this uh, huge effort on, on, on doing the, uh, the micro resonators. Uh, what is the, the level of the quality of the surface that you uh, obtain? Uh, the, the surface as a, uh, as a role uh, when you are computing, for example, the patch, the patch effect and the Casimir effect, etc. Uh, um, uh, uh, are you able to do a map of the surface that, uh, of these micro resonators that you uh, uh, are obtaining using these techniques or etching? I again don't know whether I understand the question correctly. Um, you are asking whether we cannot only measure the amplitude that is induced by the interaction, but also the phase what shift I, I, between? What I'm saying is that when you are, uh, uh, you have shown uh, the limits uh, uh, of the experiments, uh, and there are several uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the lowest one is due to the Casimir effect, and then there, are, there is an higher one which is the, uh, given by the patches effect. So these are influenced, all these curves are influenced by the state of the surface. Of, of, of the objects. So uh, do, you, uh, do you plan to have a map uh, of the status of the surface of these micro ah, objects or okay. not? Um, yes, definitely. Um, the nice thing is that all the, most of the other contributions you can actually map out. You can let some air in and create some stronger um, residual gas coupling. You can bring the masses closer together and uh, benefit from the enhancement of Casimir forces at lower distances. Um, such things. You can charge up your oscillator and increase electrostatic interaction. So you can definitely map out most of these effects and then um, be quite confident that the only thing left over is actually gravity. Mm -hmm. However, I should state we don't foresee, for the first stage, we don't foresee to reduce such effects, to subtract such effects because our main limiting noise term is the thumb noise, and that's just incoherent and cannot be mapped out or sensed elsewhere. Okay, thank you so much. I think you have to go, to go on. Huh? Oh. Sorry.